Welcome to Superintendent Radio Network. I'm Guy Soprano. This is our second disease discussion podcast of 2022, and joining us is a terrific guest, Chris Anderson, the Director of Turfgrass Management at Nemecon, a 36-hole high-end resort and private golf course community in the mountains of southwestern Pennsylvania. And Nemecon has not one, but two peat dye design golf courses. We cover a variety of topics with Chris, including how awesome it really is to work at a property like Nemecolin, what he did to establish his agronomic and disease control programs, and also his career journey and what it took to land a job like the one he has. But before we get going with Chris, a word from the sponsor of the Disease Discussion podcast series, Encardis Fungicide is a dual action preventive and curative solution designed to help you start and finish your season strong. Get up to 28 days of long-lasting protection against 10-plus key foliar diseases, including dollar spot, brown patch, anthracnose, and more for healthier, disease-free turf all season long. Ask your DSR how you can add Encardis fungicide to your toolbox this EOP season, or learn more at betterturf.bsf.us. Now on to our conversation with Chris. Well, Chris, it's great to have you on the podcast. It's awesome to get a chance to catch up with you. Let's get right into it. Two peat dye design golf courses, the mountains of southwestern Pennsylvania. Just describe the awesomeness of where you work in your own words. Well, Nimicolin is a very unique property up here on top of the mountain. It's about 2,000 feet elevation, and the property here spans about 2,000 acres. And the golf courses are a small part of that, um, roughly about 300, 350 acres of of golf course and driving range and uh, a golf academy um, practice area as well that we take care of and the the views and just the property itself here at the resort something i never expected when i got here and it's it's uh it's something else it's very nice yeah and on the golf end chris how busy of a place is nemecolin and describe your team's responsibilities to our listeners the um, the golf at the resort is is another amenity for the resort. It's not the busiest aspect of the resort here, but we've gotten, you know, we're, we're getting a little more traction. We we have started a new membership. The uh, the Woodlands Club at Nemecolin is a new membership drive that we're doing. So that's gaining traction. Last year we did about um, 15,000 rounds total for both courses. So the numbers aren't high, but we do provide a, you know, a quality condition for the resort guests that do come and play in our membership. You've been in your position now close to four years. Dang, time goes fast. Uh, what have you learned in that time about the courses, managing people, and doing everything that you do at, at a high level? Well, when I when I started here at Nemecolin, I was kind of jumping in with both feet, um, to be honest. I had come from the Greenbrier before that, and I kind of went from being an assistant to a superintendent to now overseeing 36 holes in a matter of about, you know, seven months, eight months. So I made the, those moves rather quickly. What I've learned in that time is, you know, patience and being able to build a, a solid team around, around me that's really helped me in the four years that I've been here. I've got a very strong group of superintendents and assistants that are uh, some of the best that I've ever been around, and they uh, strive to make the place better every day and in turn makes uh, my job a lot easier because of the passion they have for the for the property as well. You sort of touched on it, but this isn't the first time you've worked at a golf resort and residential community in the mountains. Tell our listeners about your career path and what led you to the position you're at now. So going back to earlier in my career, I started out in Columbus, Ohio at two different courses and spent about 10 years at those two places and was fortunate enough to get an assistant position at the Old White TPC at the Greenbrier um, back in 2016. You know, got some experience there with resort um, membership, golf, uh, multiple courses, seeing how the operations, you know, kind of run there being multiple courses and which, you know, in turn helped me extremely in this case now for where I am. But there's a lot of similarities. The big properties, 
uh, a large number of amenities and a lot of, you know, similarities in that way. The, we're a little bit smaller in the hotel sense room-wise, but we offer some things that, you know, a lot of other places don't. Climate, you know, kind of stuff is similar but different at the same time, being we're on top of a mountain here at Nemecolin, and at the Greenbrier, we're kind of down in the valley, so the the climate's uh, a lot different growing-wise um, than, than we are here now. At the Greenbrier, for those that don't know that, obviously – placed everyone there in that community in a tough situation in 2016. Uh, looking back on it, Chris, how did going through that flood and that recovery at the Greenbrier shape your career, and how did that change your outlook? Yeah, the flood at the Greenbrier is something that I'm never um, going to forget, and I, I'll have a bond with, with all those guys at the Greenbrier probably for the rest of my life just from that situation we went through there. But so much thrown at us from um, getting right, getting prepared to host a PJ event and then the flood happening, you know, 10 days prior. And then for the next year, basically in a, a race for time to get the course ready for the PGA Tour again. And just the amount of being adaptable and the amount of change and just being able to plan to accomplish that was uh, makes things uh, you look back on it and you think you know like I did a we did a bunker renovation here on Mystic Rock last year and planning for it seemed like um, a walk in the park compared to the you know the time frame we dealt with at, with the most stuff we did at the Greenbrier so it's really kind of it makes things Perspective-wise, seem nothing is impossible here or anywhere anymore with the with the amount of work in the product we produced in that year's time to host that event again. Yeah, and then in, in 2018, you were the head superintendent at the Old White for the PGA Tour event. Then a few months later, you land at Nemecol. And when you get to Nemecol, and um, how do you go about building an agronomic program? What did it take to learn the land and what, what you needed to do to the, to the turf to get it to the level that you wanted it to play at? So for that first season, I came here late in the season, mm -hmm. like in August, and kind of just went with the program that they had set in place for the remainder of that year just to see how things um, reacted to products and give me some time to kind of feel out what worked for me in the last remaining parts of the growing season and what changes I might want to do going into the next year. I'm a big early order person here, so I do a lot of, of my ordering in the early order programs from, you know, distributors and stuff. So it gave me a little bit of time to kind of prepare and get that stuff ready going into, you know, that following season. Mm -hmm. And basically here at year four now, I feel like, We've, we've got the meat and potatoes of our program pretty much dialed in with uh, fertility, growth regulators, um, like fertilizer programs, things like that. We've got pretty much hold fast and we don't make many changes off of the main, the main program. We do adjust some, you know, soil nutrients and foliar nutrients and things like that, just depending on what we're seeing, but it's probably taken close to three or four years to get the products in line that, that I like and we like here and the things that work best for us in the conditions that we have and the soil types that we have here. So I feel pretty good about the program we've, we've built here. But like I said, we've always, um, we're always tweaking things here and there for the next year. Yeah. And 2018 was really the, the first time you, that you went through an early order program, right? As the director, that head person, how did you handle it then? Who did you turn to for help, and how much easier does it get each year now when you're making those decisions? So I have some really good reps here that I use, and all of, all of those reps that I use were very good about you know explaining how things work, how to get you know the best rebates, when's the best time to get things, just kind of showing me you know the the ways to 
get the most bang for your buck as well and and using you know the dollars i'm giving the best way i can so you know talking with all my distributor reps and uh chemical reps from from this area they really helped me out and i i relied on um my old boss kelly shoemate from the greenbrier a lot as well to help me kind of build my program out and throwing ideas off of each other on what what's best and what's you know what might work and what maybe st- to stray away from things like that but you know I, I relied a lot on outside resources that first year and I still do um, yeah. when I do that stuff but talking with as many guys as I can about you know that process really helped out before we get back to this great discussion with Chris let's talk about something that could help you on the golf course want to control disease with powerful precision Navicon Intrinsic brand fungicide is a dual action DMI fungicide that can be sprayed at any time in any temperature. This unique and highly effective chemistry safely controls tough turf diseases throughout the year. And the added power of the Intrinsic brand fungicide gets to the root of the problem, maintaining plant health by strengthening from the ground up. Add Navicon Intrinsic brand fungicide to your rotation and help keep your greens pristine. Visit betterturf.basf.com dot us to learn more now back to our conversation with chris yeah and with 36 holes chris there's there's a lot to, to consider i mean it, it, it's something that just doesn't happen in a day or two does it to build a program and figure out what you need like i said I, the meat and potatoes is you know pretty much big so i don't stray away too much from my main things but that initial program build you know it was a uh, close probably three weeks a month to get you know things the amounts of chemical we need, the um, the timings for the deliveries, like things like that, all squared away. The pricing, making sure everything's good that way. Because I actually order in early order for the entire season, so I have I have every app um, laid out from the beginning to the end of the season for grains approaches, like all all thin grass surfaces that we uh, I order for. So. I like doing it that way. Kind of takes a little bit of, you know, that later work about having to worry about ordering things in season and, you know, at the time worrying about if we're going to be able to get them or not. So I like to just get it all out of the way in early order so I don't have to really worry about it too much in season. And then if we need to make any changes or if I need to get something in season, it's a lot easier um, on us that way. I would say it's a little stressful for about three weeks, but after that, you know, it takes a lot of the pressure off worrying about the rest of the year. Chris, do you manage Mystic Rock and Shepherd's Rock the same? They're courses that were built in different decades, or are there different microclimates and different turf varieties throughout the two golf courses? So we do have different um, turf varieties. Um, Mystic Rock was built and opened in 1995, so we've got some older bent grasses. We do have the same bent grass types on greens. We do have A1, A4 on both sets of greens, Shepherds and Mystic. Fairway grasses are our newer um, varieties on Shepherds. We have 007 in fairways and T1 on Ts. So those can handle, you know, a little bit more stress and stuff like that. But the older, like, Pen Trio is what we have on Ts and fairways on Mystic Rock. With the different grass varieties, I found the only difference in the programs between the two courses that we do right now is the growth regulators we use on greens on both. Uh, Mystic has a little bit more POA um, mixed in with those greens, you know, being 30, uh, close to 30 years old now. So we maintain those a little bit different. I've decided that we're just going to maintain the POA that we have in them and grow them the way they are. Shepherds being, was, was reopened in 2017 after a big renovation. Their greens barely have any POA, so I use a lot of more PGRs that, you know, tend to ding up the POA a lot more over there and try to keep it out as much as I can. But other than that, everything else is the exact same. I treat tees and fairways the exact same on both courses. Just, it makes it simpler for, for all of us here when it comes to the program that way. How much bent grass do you have between the two courses approximately? Between the courses, the driving range, and the practice area, we have 
uh, 95 acres of bent grass. That's a heck of a lot of bent grass. Uh, what, what's the disease pressure like on that bent grass? What, do, what are you looking out for when you get into the disease and pest season? Honestly, our, it's, we're very fortunate here. We're at a little bit of elevation, about 2,000 feet. So the disease pressure isn't nearly as high up here as some places I've been before, but our biggest ones, um, and I haven't seen much, um, knock on wood, since I've been here um, in four years, but we get some dollar spot, a little bit of brown patches, um, the two biggest, a um, little bit of fairy ring and fairways and rough, but dollar spot would be the biggest one that we're dealing with up here. Haven't seen really any anything else. When it comes to diseases, we do keep up regularly on our on our program. We spray preventatively, so um, most of the times, if we get a breakthrough or is when we get a skip um, somewhere on the edges or and stuff like that, that's um, we're fortunate enough to be able to do that. And the uh, dollar spot would be the biggest one. When do you start uh, your dollar spot control program, and when does it end? And what what are some tools that help you have success against it? I start hitting it pretty hard um as soon as the snow breaks and the temperatures get um soil temperatures get up i start hitting it um usually late late march just with a few contacts to try to clean anything up that may be around from the winter time and then use some like dmis early season to really kind of knock it back i did make one change in my snow mold program this past year and did some pcnb that uh, I haven't sprayed before. I, I read some good things about it that, you know, it was good for snow mold control and, you know, helping to knock back a lot of that early season dollar spot um, pressure as well. Basically, from the beginning of the year all the way until, you know, late October, we're spraying um, contacts and things that control dollar spot throughout the entire season. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the, the late October. I mean, how much later into the year is dollar spot becoming a concern in an environment like yours? Well, we start to get pretty cold um, towards the end of October. Mm -hmm. So the latest I'm really been concerned about it is probably into like late September. Mm -hmm. But I still spray for it into into October just to make sure covered up. And, yeah. you know, I don't want to go into the wintertime having any weak turf, just making sure we're as strong as we can be going into the winter time. It sounds like you're pretty fortunate, Chris. Anthracnose is not a concern of yours. I know in Western Pennsylvania, it, it, it can be a problem, but it sounds like the elevation is helping you in your case with anthracnose. Yeah, no, hardly any anthracnose. I haven't seen it since I've been here. We have a lot of bent grass, not much POA mm -hmm. um, on our surfaces. So we don't get a lot of pressure for anthracnose. And um, we just, yeah, it's just something that, I mean, everything we spray for, spray with, mm -hmm. um, we're covering for ourselves for anthracnose, but it's not one of those things that we see hardly at all. Yeah. There have been a lot of uh, new disease control tools to come out in the market in the last four years. It seems like every year I'm writing about a half dozen of them. Uh, where, where do you go to learn about them, and how important is it to stay open-minded towards some of the solutions that are coming out? I tend to go to as many continuing education, anything that distributors are having to show off new products or talking to my reps or um, distributors just um, and manufacturers, distributors as well, just to try to get as much um, knowledge about new products as they can and just to see what's out there because something that could come out might benefit the program longevity-wise in a spray or it might, you know, we might be able to spray a new combo product that's, you know, less mixing, one less thing in the tank where we can, you know, find a new product. Like I just sprayed, um, for example, Encardis is, you know, a good dollar spot control for us and it's got a combo now and it and it's a 21-day label rate. And I'm very, I'm 21 days on tees and fairways here. So we spray every three weeks on them. And there's a lot of good chemicals out there that have 21 days on the label now. And I try to stretch those to 21 days as much as I can just, to, you know, save us a little bit of money and, and time. There's a lot of good products out there now that have 28 days on the label. I've been considering, you know, with the climate that we have here, trying 
my hand at getting 28 days on some of these products, and I'm I'm pretty confident there's a lot of products out there on the market. I'm a big BASF person when it comes to dollar spot control, and I use them heavily throughout um, the summertime. Exemplar, um, Encardis, Maxima are some of my big ones, and uh, I know I'm getting 21 days out of them, and those are the ones I'm going to probably try to stretch to 28 days maybe next year to see how it works out. How do you set up your programs? Is it is it a team philosophy? Do you give your course superintendents an opportunity to make input, or or does it strictly come from you? Describe how, how you handle it with the, the different superintendents you have on the courses. Once we get through the end of the year and we're getting towards that early order program, when we, we all sit down together and go through the program um, again, and everybody puts their input in, if they want to see anything different or make any changes or what didn't work for the year that well, you might want to um, look at for the following season. And it's, um, it's a group uh, coordinated effort for sure. I, I like to get those guys involved as much as I can. That way, you know, one day when they're um, in the position to make the final decision that they've had that experience to uh, be comfortable with it at the same time. Now, you have such an amazing perspective on so many things, Chris. I've been fortunate. I've known you for a while now. And if somebody came up to you and said, hey, I, I want a job like yours. I want to be a director at a multi-course facility. What would what advice would you give them about working at a high-end multi-course facility? Don't be scared. You know, I made a pretty big jump in that eight months time. And you just don't have any hesitations. And, you know, talk to as many people as you can. Um about you know their experiences what what to look forward to what might come up that you haven't dealt with before and and prior to making a move for a position like this just try to work at you know courses as you're going through your career that you want to end up at so you know for me moving to the Greenbrier I wanted to host a PGA tournament um, was one of my main goals when I went there and I got a lot more out of that experience at the Green Bar than I ever could imagine. But it's, you know, it set me up for for this step in my career now, being um, going from one resort to another and, and just having that background and working towards the place you want to work at and just trying to get as much experience as possible on the way. You manage a lot of turf, a lot of people. You get to see a lot of golfers coming from a lot of different places. What's the most rewarding thing about having a role like yours, Chris? I, I really enjoy when my guys can see that the product is good and we're getting in the, the mindset and the, the direction that we want to continue to take the two courses here. Um, we've, we've made a lot of strides in, in the last you know three years, and I really enjoy when they take the pride and they can sit back and see that, um, that they're doing a nice job. And when they get... In turn, when the resort guests and members write us compliments and, you know, tell us while we're out the golf course that, you know, that it's enjoyable for them and the courses look good for them and they play well. That's really what it's all about when it comes to the end of the day. It's tough to see it on a podcast. Or, and if our listeners haven't been there, they may not quite realize it. But just how spectacular is the scenery at Nemecon and around Nemecon? And do you ever get a chance to... Uh, do anything off the course in the Laurel Highlands of Pennsylvania? Yeah, the, the views up here on top of the mountain at the resort are pretty phenomenal. There's there's one place on property where you can see into three states at once. The, the views span that long into Maryland, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania all in one spot. So the fall colors are, are really good here. You get a lot of low-lying fog that really makes things look cool in the morning sometimes. A lot of great sunrises and sunsets. Just the surrounding area in general is, it's a outdoors type of place. Some great fishing. There's some great hiking nearby. Ohio Pile is a uh, state park just down the road. They offer some really good rafting and, and some great restaurants and stuff down there. So it's nice to get out and enjoy the area as well. And, you know, I've met a lot of good people here at the resort that we get to enjoy the outside as well, not just here at their property, but we do a lot of things outside of the out of work as well. So it makes it extremely uh, enjoyable here. Do you ever get a chance to enjoy the product that your team produces and 
how cool is it to be around two Pete Dye design golf courses? What strikes you about those designs if you ever do get a chance to play them? So we are fortunate here. We can we can play pretty much any time we want, fortunately. Mm-hmm. We also have a the nine hole associate league through the resort that is on Monday, so associates can come out and play the golf courses as well. And it kinda you know, you meet a lot of different people from the resort that way and they can come out and enjoy the courses. But yeah, we can play when we want just about any time. So that's a very fortunate benefit that we do have here. Pete Dye did some great work here. Mystic Rock is, you know, that that nineties Pete Dye, big bunkers. Uh, we have about 200,000 square feet of sand, so there's a lot of big, old deep dye um, bunkers and, you know, smaller fairways than Shepherds. But, you know, Shepherds is that, you know, towards the end of his um, career, he kind of broadened things out. We have 40-acre fairways on Shepherds and a lot of tiny, like, pop-style bunkers, which in tune we have 139. Um, bunkers on Shepherd. So there, uh, there's a lot of differences in the two courses here, and I think that is good for the resort and kind of gives our guests and members uh, a little different perspective on what Pete Dye did throughout his career, kind of towards the middle and towards the end of just uh, how he changed throughout his design career and, you know, the types of courses he built. Uh, you have a chance to protect and preserve these incredible designs what are the next three to five years going to be like for you and the team chris so like i mentioned before we just finished up a a bunker renovation on mystic rock um, last season i would love to um touch up on some teas and get um a new irrigation system put in on mystic just uh uh the 30 year old system is kind of starting to show its age and we're really looking to become a little, a lot more efficient on our water use. And the way the irrigation system is laid out over there isn't as efficient as that I would like it to be. So that would really help, you know, us, us long term and the amount of water we use and and stuff like that going forward. And also, we're really making a big push to try to get um, some type of event back here. Um, we're trying to get the golf courses in the condition that we think they're ready for a bigger event. And, you know, we used to host the 84 Lumber Classic here back in the early 2000s. And my staff and I and myself uh, would really love to get that opportunity again at some point in time here down the road. Let's hope that happens. Heck, I went to an event at Mystic Rock in the late 1990s growing up as a teenager in western Pennsylvania. It is a tremendous tournament venue. And Chris... I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join the podcast and congrats on everything uh, you and the team have achieved at Namacon. Thank you, Guy, and I, I appreciate the opportunity and I really enjoy talking with you. We've, we've done a, a lot of work together here the last you know, you know, know, three or four years and I, I always enjoy talking to you and I appreciate you having me on.